Well, good morning, all. It's time again. Hammer time. Thank you. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? These hammer time sermons that I've been preaching some since the beginning of the year are not going to tickle your ears, but they hopefully will be breaking up the rocks of our foolish thinking. Are you ready for another one? Amen. All right. The hammer's about to drop. Stop talking dirty! Well, you know that's not in the Bible. Oh, contraire. Yes, it is. I'll let God say stop talking dirty. But sexual immorality and impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So what is crude or filthy or dirty talk? Well, it doesn't say specifically. But one thing is for sure, cut it out. <laughs> I may not give an example in every respect to your liking, but I know one thing, there is such a thing as filthy talk, dirty talk. And the Lord says, cut it out. And may I all already be dropping another hammer, and this is really not emphasized in my notes, but I want to make sure I share it. This will keep you out of heaven. Dirty talk will keep you out of heaven. Sometimes dirty talk changes through history. It will also change from place to place. I lived in England for two years, and if I use the word bloody, not describing my nose bleeding, I was talking dirty. But in the U.S., bloody oath, or bloody this or that. Somebody either, one, doesn't know that that's a cuss word, or they think I'm trying to imitate those of Britain. But don't play dumb! Just because there are changes in time and history and changes in places doesn't change the fact that there is such a thing as filthy talk. Right. Cut it out! As you can see in the context, it's still behind me on the slide, as you can see the context is sexual talk that's dirty. Sexual vulgarities. The verse both before and after the mention of laying off the dirty talk is describing things like fornication, impurities of uncleanness, even covetousness. And you might say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with sex. Oh, yes, it does. You remember the Ten Commandments? I know you do. And it says, thou shalt not covet. Yes. And what was the first one? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So whether you're talking about covetousness, impurity, or fornication, both before and after the discussion of talk, sandwiched right smack in the middle of that talk about filthy, foolish, crude kind of talk is probably at least including sex talk. Mark this down. God not only wants us not engaging in sexual immorality, He doesn't want us to have a potty mouth about it either. He doesn't want us to use lewd words either. He doesn't want us to reference bodily functions or sexual body parts to be degrading to people. You know what I mean. Don't act dumb. You know what I mean. And I don't want to give examples because there's children and ladies present. I guess when I was putting this together, I was thinking, well, that sounds like men, it's okay. Well, you know what I'm saying. I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's not good for men either. I'll venture one just to be, and I'll be very careful for women and children and men who probably shouldn't be thinking about it either. Using a part of one's backside anatomy where they go to the bathroom to describe a person that they want to speak disparaging of. That's all I'm going to say. Your mind right now already knows what I'm talking about. And I'm not going to give you how many letters in the word. But you know exactly what I mean. Sometimes you could speak about that part of your body in a respectful way. But they are often used as dirty, filthy, obscene ways. And God says, clean up that mouth of yours. Clean it up. 
And a brief word about euphemisms, too, while I'm at it. Some, sometimes substituting, and that's what euphemisms are, is substituting a less offensive word for one that's more offensive. That might be the foolish talk that he's talking about there, right in the midst of talking dirty, filthy, crude. He says, also foolish talking. And maybe that could be at least including such. I'll risk a couple examples and hope that the little ears are not in tune yet with what I'm talking about. Describing something as a bunch of BS. Or calling someone a dirty SOB. An abbreviated way to sexually put someone down because of the stigma attached to being born to a woman of that kind. Or simply put, F you. Let's let God drop the hammer again. You must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Now this context is not sexual. This one here is coming from a context of ugly talk from a mean, hateful, and angry place or attitude. Malicious attitudes are often what's causing us to speak the way we do. Meaning, malicious, we're hateful, we're angry, we are somewhat thinking maliciously. Prompting us then when we get upset about something or we get peeved about something to grasp for, for words that will convey, convey just how disdainful we feel to another. And so what do we do? We stoop. We stoop real low. We go down to the base, sometimes the most obscene of levels, to talk. Using in some cases out and out bad, lewd, bleepity bleep kind of words. In other cases, though, the gutter talk is not necessarily cussing like a sailor, but it is using, once again, euphemisms. Now, once again, I'm, I'm aware that there's little ones here, and your parents are saying, don't use it, don't use it, don't say it. I'm not going to say it. But I will show you a mild euphemism as a replacement word of this kind. What attitude is it that causes you to refer to people as sleaze balls or sleaze bags? Where is that coming from? Well, it's true. They're a bunch of sleaze balls. They're a bunch of sleaze bags. Really? Really? Look it up in the dictionary in case, I don't know, I just use it because I heard it and I think it fits how just much I think that guy is a bunch of, well, don't go use other words. So I just call him a sleaze bag. Or here's one. That's a bunch of bull. My dad in Griffith, Indiana in the mid-60s apologized most sincerely for having used the word bull in his preaching. He was upset about something that he was preaching about and he said, that's just a bunch of bull. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And if you start calling people sleaze bags, you're going to hell. That's not what he said. No, he said one actually nicer than sleazebag. Fool will get you there too. Doesn't mean that a person isn't foolish. And you might could say he is a fool for the Bible describes it such. So where is he coming off with this idea? I can't even call people names. I got a sermon coming up probably who knows when. I have all these ideas that I never get around to. I want to do a sermon called This Matter of Calling People Names. Or Name Calling. But that will have to be another time. My mother literally, not figuratively, washed my mouth out with soap. Such an abusive woman. No, she was not that. But I didn't do it too many times. That, that soap tastes bad. But I had a bar of soap in my mouth for a few seconds or minutes. Probably seconds. But anyway, she had me put soap in my mouth. You know how bad that was? Yeah, that was bad. My mom never did that to me. I, I know one you need to be more fearful of. If that's what your mom did, what's God going to do? It won't be soap in your mouth. All right, I'm about through. So what's the big deal? I've got four answers. There may be five, but that's all i got. One thing wrong. What's God's concern? So what with all that you've said thus far? First of all, it's out of the abundance of your heart that you're speaking. 
Luke 6.45 says, From the abundance of a heart a man speaks. Our filthy mouth is revealing a filthy heart. Don't deny it. Don't deny it. Because you're making God out to be a liar on this page when you do. Whoops, didn't need to change it yet. Sorry, back. People judge us by the words we use. If we're going to have the best influence for Christ that we possibly can, then we've got to include in that how we say, what we say, and what kind of words we don't use as a way to be the most productive or best in our influence possible. Two more and I'm done. James teaches in his book, chapter 3, 2, if you could control your speech, you could control your whole life. It's a little bit idealistic, but it's out there and it's in the scripture, so let's go with it. Our words are forming us too. I need to stress that again. I put it in caps, the word us. The way we talk is forming us Amen. too. It is reinforcing, for good or bad, the kind of people we are becoming. Is it this or is it this? Which way are you headed? And fourth, I've already said it, but I'll say it again. This will end you up in the bad place. This is judgment. I tell you, Jesus says, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. One more hammer blow. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. No corrupting talk. But only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those that hear. Let's cut out the filthy talk. Amen.